Welcome to What That Means with Camille, where we take the confusion out of tech jargon and encourage more meaningful conversation about cybersecurity. Here is your host, Camille Moorhart. Hi, and welcome to today's episode of Cybersecurity Inside, What That Means, Confidential Computing. I've got with me today Amy Santoni, who's fellow and also in charge of Xeon Security at Intel. It might be worth noting I have another conversation on the same topic, confidential computing, with Ron Perez, also a fellow at Intel and chief security architect of Intel. I'm having two conversations on the same topic with two fellows so we can really dive in and understand each of their perspectives. Today, welcome to the show, Amy Santoni. Before we get into the definition of confidential computing, I'm hoping you can just tell us what is Xeon for those people who may not be familiar with it. Xeon's a line of processors that Intel produces that's targeted for data center usages. The traditional data center usages are the multi-sockets that could be used either by enterprise or cloud. We also use the Xeon brand for new capabilities that are coming, like for 5G routers. We have a line of Xeons for 5G base stations. We also have a line that's targeting networking. So we kind of have different lines targeted for different data center usages, but all supporting that data center transformation that's happening right now. So we're in the server space. Server space, yep. Okay. As opposed to like a PC. Correct. So will you also then do us the favor of defining confidential computing in a couple of minutes? That is a buzzword that's all over the place. Confidential computing is really about protecting the data while it's being processed. If you look at the journey we've had with data, we started encrypting data at rest, so on the disk, the hard drives. We have been encrypting data as it transports. So when I go from my laptop to a website, the HTTPS, that is the secure network layer. And so now the next generation is, how do I make sure it's protected while it's in the DRAM and processing in the CPU? Why is that the third one that we're looking at? I think it followed the attack vectors. If you think about how malware started, started corrupting things on your disk. And then people started putting sniffers or using things at the network side to intercept things between point A and point B. And so this is where the attacks are going and where we need to start protecting. So that's how it's been evolved. What sort of use cases do you think it's going to be enabling or what are you seeing it enabling already? There's lots of different use cases, but the one I'm most excited about are the ones that are enabling new data sharing among different entities while preserving privacy. So we call that privacy preserving analytics, but really it's like saying got hospital A, hospital B, they both have a lot of data on patients. And one of the examples that's recent is COVID x-rays. I have all these x-rays and I can share it and I can put it into an AI model. I can train an AI model to look at these different x-rays and improve the accuracy of the the x-ray and, and, and automate it. And I can get data from all the hospitals to train these models. And I'm still preserving the privacy of the, the patients who have the x-rays because I'm getting the data about the x-ray to train the model that can then be shared by all these hospitals, but I'm still preser- preserving the privacy of all the individual patients. I talked with Olga Perpelkina at Intel a little bit ago on federated learning. She was talking about how this is like a distributed model of artificial intelligence where the model actually moves or the aggregator actually moves to the end user and the private data remains in place. It doesn't travel, say in this case from the hospital or from the imaging system. Is this a different mechanism to allow the data to be used or is it for something like that? It could be used in both. Confidential compute could could apply to both of those use models. It's really about where the AI model sits, meaning Someone has to train an AI model, and then I can take that trained model and put it on an endpoint. And the confidential com- compute can protect that model, uh, whether it's at the endpoint or whether it's on a server. The training tends to be more intensive and tends to be done on server or special hardware. Once I have a trained model to say, hey, is this a picture of a cat? That can be done at endpoints or it can be done on CPUs in general, depending on the performance requirements. And you would use confidential computing in either of those scenarios. So you could use confidential computing at the endpoint to protect the model to make sure someone on a phone can't corrupt the model. And you can protect it in training to make sure only valid data is coming into the model. So there's an attestation aspect to say, hey, this data is coming from hospital A 
Um, and here's its credentials, so I know it's from Hospital A versus random person on the web. So a couple of the terms that come up are secure enclave and trusted execution environment. Can you explain what those are in the context of confidential computing? Confidential computing involves three main vectors. One is protecting the data. When it's in the DRAM, we have encryption. So if anyone steals your DRAM and tries to dump it, they're not going to see the plain text data. There's an encryption part of protecting the confidentiality of the data while it's sitting in DRAM. Once it comes from the DRAM into the CPU, it gets decrypted. Then we need to create a hardware-based environment to protect that data running on that CPU from other code and data running on that CPU. That's that trusted execution environment. And Secure Enclaves is an example of a it is a particular trusted execution environment. And so it protects that code and data while it's being processed within the CPU. The third vector is how do I let the person writing the software, how do they know it's running on genuine good hardware? Because with all these virtualization techniques and emulators, we want to make sure that no one can trick the software. We have protections in place to make sure it's non-spoofable. So why wouldn't we put everything in a trusted ex execution environment? Or why wouldn't we put every, absolutely everything we're doing in a computer? Why is there anything that's not part of it? There's a couple of considerations. One is nothing's for free. So when I put something into a, a new construct in the CPU, there's some performance costs to it. So we try to minimize it, but, but it's not free. There's also software enabling. So the software has to understand this new hardware construct. And the third is how confidential is the data? Maybe the data is not confidential enough or they're not worried about that data. And so, you know, why take the extra work or performance costs to do it? So it kind of varies based on those considerations. What kinds of data would you put in it? Obviously, look, very confidential or personal data you would want to put in there. Are you putting it in at the detailed data level? Or are, you, are you choosing an application that you're putting in? Are you picking an OS? Because, you're, of course, you're talking about a server, so you could even have multiple OSs on a single server. So what level are you making your decision at? Different trusted execution environments have different levels. We have software guard extensions, and that's targeted for application writers. It runs at the application level priority within the CPU. And you can put your whole app in it, or you can split your app. Let's call it trusted and untrusted parts, depending on how much software development. There's other trusted execution environments that work more at an OS layer. So it includes the operating system and all the applications that run on top of that operating system. And that's another way you can draw the boundary. At e basically, at each, you get to choose the granularity within your app, how much you want to put in trusted and untrusted. So the app developer is, is the person who's deciding what portions of the app. It, it can be, or they could put the whole app. There's a capability, an open source project called Grameen that tries to make it easy to take your whole application and put it in a container. And so the amount of enabling using like a Grameen goes way down. If you're writing a security focused application and understand all of the constructs, you, you can split your app into these trusted and untrusted parts. But it, again, the level of detail and the level of software enabling is greater in that second case, but it, it reduces, reduces the attack surface to the smallest possible one because you're cutting out a part of your app and saying, this is the most critical part that I wanna protect. And all the rest of the app is untrusted. It can't get to that data in the vault. And so you can create a little vault within your app. And so there's trade-offs between how much software development you want to do to, to protect, let's call it a portion of your app versus, you know, if I just took my app today, wrapping it in some sort of container that's in a trusted execution environment still gives you some extra protection that you wouldn't have had if you didn't wrap it. And, and it could go more granular. So it depends on, on the trade-off of what you're trying to protect. A question for you on, there's two different trends that are both happening simultaneously. There's this decentralization or distribution of data that we kind of see with blockchain. And we see with, again, some emerging use cases within artificial intelligence and machine learning, like federated learning. Then on the other side, we've got this major push to putting a lot of data in cloud service providers, which seems like more of a centralized kind of a data approach. So how does, does confidential computing play into each one of those? It's not centralizing. It, for people who move to the cloud, let's say they, were, they had a private set of servers that they owned and maintained, and that costs money, 
you got to have the people service it. You got to have people keep the software up to date and stuff like that. One of the benefits of moving to cloud is, hey, I can take, I, I don't have to have my own on-premise computing. I can go to cloud. And one of the promises of confidential computing or what cloud service providers are telling us is, hey, by offering confidential computing, it's taking some of those customers who were reluctant to come to cloud before because they were worried about their data being shared and, and on the same system as other people's data. The example, a lot of our marketing people are do the Pepsi and Coke, right? Like their secret mm-hmm. recipe for Coke and the secret recipe for Pepsi, and they both offloaded to the cloud and you don't want the software for Coke to accidentally get the recipe for Pepsi and vice versa. And one of the things that confidential compute does is it, it hardens the virtual machines that Coke and Pepsi would rent. And it makes it so that the data that is in that container, some sort of trusted execution environment, there's different ones out there, as I said, but it makes sure that, hey, the Coke stuff is encrypted differently or has access control that's different from the Pepsi one. And so the data is not centralized, meaning the customer or the companies renting from cloud still own the data. But what confidential computing is bringing is extra confidence that I can take these things that maybe I wasn't comfortable taking to cloud before move them to cloud, and I have this extra hardware layer of protection to keep my data private from other people running on the same machine, but also from the cloud service provider or from that virtual machine monitor. And that's the that's the promise that the, confi- that the cloud service providers want to offer. Mm-hmm. And they believe that'll help move some people who are reluctant to come to cloud to move to cloud because there's this new construct and new hardware and new capabilities around it. Was there a catalyst to making confidential computing a reality? I'm thinking, of course, COVID, because so much stuff had to move to the cloud quickly. Was that a, a true catalyst, and have there been others? I think that there there was a, a push for this even before COVID, of the move to protect the data while it's being computed. When people realized that the government could could get to some data they didn't think they could get to. That's where it raised awareness. And then people started saying, hey, I got to, you know, I need some protections in place. It would take advanced tech, hardware level techniques to be able to break some of these things. Nothing's 100% unbreakable. Let me put it that way, right? But the, the bar went way up prior to confidential compute, right? The OS or the VMM had access to the application's data. And what we did is we're, we're hardening, let's call it a layer around the application or even around in a virtual machine to prevent the virtual machine software to access the data within there. And that's why we said, that's why the cloud service providers believe providing these extra layers of uh, protection will grow their business because some people who wouldn't have moved their data into an environment they didn't feel they had enough control over the protection of their data, they may now move their data there. Is there a trajectory over time where we would ultimately have everything encrypted and protected while it's in use just because there's no longer a performance constraint? We've heard Microsoft say they think that the majority of their cloud infrastructure as a service will be running in a trusted execution environment in this decade. That's the projections. The predictions I've seen say 2025, 2026, so not that far away. What about uh, quantum compute? How does that play out here? The the latest data I have is that if you have an AES with a 256-bit key, you're protected from quantum. What generally, when you're, if you're in charge of security for Xeon, what is the spectrum of things that you're looking at in your role? I, I tend to look at how do I harden the foundation of the boot cycle? How do I know that I'm booting what I expected to boot and that all of that firmware and and data that I load is authentic. And there's been new shifts in the industry where people are adding these external roots of trust that want to gather information all the time, almost like a heartbeat thing. Hey, what are you running now? Hey, what are you running now? Did I authorize that? Did you, did something change? And if it changed, was, was I aware of that? So I spend some time on that, spend time on the confidential computing. And then the third vector that we look at is memory safety. How can we help software be safer? Software is complex. Software's got many lines of code. How do we make sure, are there hooks we can put in hardware to help the software writers to make their software more secure, less vulnerable to known software attacks? So those are the three vectors that I tend to spend time on. And are any of the newer trends like machine learning or artificial intelligence 
did those kinds of things change fundamentally how we're looking at server? I mean, the industry is looking at server security, or is it? Do those kinds of things just fall into line with what's already being looked at? You talked about buzzwords at the beginning. Cloud to edge is a big buzzword that you hear. How do I protect the data, whether it's being computed on the cloud or being computed more in a geographically dis dispersed environment? And, and what's the software to tie those two together? But that continues to be a, an evolving thing. What, what we're trying to do is make sure that all of those processing places along the path have a trusted execution environment. They don't all have to be the same necessarily, but has some protection. So whether I'm processing here or processing there, I have some sort of protection for my data. I'd say the other thing that at least specific to the server that's growing in importance is the physical attack protection. With big data centers, there are some extra layers of protection that could exist. But then as I, if I move computing, closer to the edge or to the end devices, or that could be in a shopping mall or the other to improve people's experience with their phone, Facebook or Verizon, or they may co-locate some of their servers together. They, they can't necessarily know the physical protection around those servers if they're putting like one in the mall and a football mm -hmm. stadium and whatnot. And so physical protection has grown in importance because you see the computing continuing to move more, more and more to lots of different places and diverse levels of how much protection exists in those environments. Base stations are on a pole um, mm -hmm. somewhere. And so, so the physical attack protection is something that has grown in importance and an awareness over the last few years I've been working in, in this area. So when you talk about physical uh, protection, are you talking about protecting servers from like somebody with a baseball bat? Or are you talking about protecting <laughs> somebody from sitting near it with a laptop who's hacking into it because they have a physical proximity to a wireless signal? So talking about like someone taking a probe and sniffing the data as it goes between the CPU and a GPU and a discrete graphics card. That link, it's usually connected by a, a protocol called PCIe that would travel in plain text. So if someone was able to sniff or, or read that data as it traveled, they could get it. And so recently in the PCIe consortium, there's a new capability to protect that link. So data traveling from one computing element to the other, it can be encrypted in integrity, but can be protected from people sniffing it. It's, it's things like that, protecting these links on the platform from physically accessing and trying to get the data. Okay, because in the classic sense of on-prem, like you were talking about before, mm -hmm. the servers that were housing your data were behind a barbed wire fence, right. in a locked door, badge entry access only, background checks, all the rest of it. And of course, possibly even more secure at cloud service providers where this is of paramount importance. And you're saying, well, as servers make their way closer and closer to the edge, in addition to those other locations, we have a new kind of an attack threat and we have less concept or guarantee of the level of protection of every single one of those servers, depending exactly. on who's in charge of its physical security and where it sits in the world. That's right, exactly. Okay. And so they're looking for hardware. They're like, can we enhance the hardware so I don't have to worry about that? Cool. Well, Amy, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate the conversation, getting to the bottom of some of these words. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Again, Amy Santoni with us today talking about confidential computing. She is senior principal engineer and in charge of security for Xeon, which is Intel's data center product. Never miss an episode of What That Means with Camille by following us here on YouTube. You can also find episodes wherever you get your podcasts. The views and opinions expressed are those of the guests and author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Intel Corporation.